As the eighth canto opens, we have journeyed along with Dante through hell, and now to the lower reaches of the Purgatorial Mountain. But it is not a painless journey. Dante has had to engage with torturous scenes and souls, some who have inspired pity in him, and those who have aroused desire. He has been taxed physically and emotionally. And we can begin to see how such a journey affects Dante. We are still in the valley that precedes the gates of the Purgatorial Mountain, this valley which is described in striking terms in Canto 7. Gold and fine silver, carmen and leaded white, indigo, lignite, bright and clear, an emerald after it has just been split, placed in that dell would see their brightness fade against the colors of the grass and flowers, as less is overcome by more. Nature had not only painted there in all her hues, but there the sweetness of a thousand scents was blended in one fragrance, strange and new. Such striking beauty in comparisons to rich materials and painted effects calls to mind the beauty of medieval churches. These edifices were designed to awe and instruct, serving as forecourts of paradise. Most notably, these churches beyond their scale are often associated with the effects of light playing upon the stained glass windows. While we often associate stained glass windows as a means of instruction for those who lack the ability to read or lack access to scripture, stained glass windows are not always easily decipherable. The late art historian Michael Camille noted that the typical medieval viewer was the person who must have relied on the literacy of another for access to pictorial art. Such a description encapsulates the challenges of looking at complex theological, aesthetic, and narrative workings in visual art. But that same description can be applied to the challenges of navigating a landscape filled with eschatological, theological, anagogical, and symbolic values. The reader needs a guide to understand what they read, and so does Dante the Pilgrim need a guide to make sense of the scene set in front of his eyes. We are granted that through Dante the Poet, and throughout the various guides and intercessors that engage with Dante during the poem. As I initially indicated, Dante has not been untouched by this journey, and so as this canto begins, he finds himself in a melancholic state. So profound is his mood that the landscape reflects back onto him that state, what Ruskin might term the pathetic fallacy. The hour that melts a sailor's heart and saddens him with longing, and when a traveler starting out is pierced with love if far away he hears a bell that seems to mourn the dying light. Dante as a pilgrim can be distracted, and so he needs an assistance in focusing on the elements that are needed. An unnamed penitent catches Dante's eye and reorients the poem, not to the dying light of the West, of things past, of the world left behind, but to the East, not because of a rising sun, but because the thoughts are focused upon the east as if the spirit said to God, for nothing else do I have any care. Not only does this soul's action stir Dante from his elegiac mood, but the song the soul sing, Te Lucis Ante Terminum, or Before the Ending of the Light, calls on the protection of God against any foes coming in the night. Such a beautiful song causes Dante to remark that it drew me out from all thoughts of myself. Again, Dante the Pilgrim can become distracted, he can become fixated on ideas that might not be profitable, but this is a landscape and a world that offers him ample opportunities to focus back on the elements that do matter. This is, I think, an essential part of these poems, the fact that Dante's journey is not solitary. He meets with spirits, some willingly, some compelled, who will speak to him on their conditions. He will meet with friends who will revive his goodwill, and he will have a constant guide to help make sense of what he sees. But all of this comes, as this canto reminds us, only through what God, by his good grace, has willed. After him seeking divine protection, Dante the poet interrupts the narrative to announce, and this will be the first of seven direct addresses to the reader in Purgatorio. Here, reader, set your gaze upon the truth, for now the veil is drawn so thin that piercing it is surely easy. Clearly, then, something momentous will occur. And the poet seems to indicate that it will be easy to understand the truth of this scene. In this moment, then, Dante the poet acts as one of our guides, focusing our attention on what is vital. Descending from above are two angels, holding flaming swords, their pointed blade tips broken off, wearing garments green as newly opened leaves, that are stirred and fanned by their green wings. These verdant figures frame the scene as they take positions on the opposite banks with the low valley between them. They are there, Sordello tells Dante, 
to guard the valley from the serpent that will soon appear. But what is the meaning of this tableau? What is the significance of the serpent? Is the serpent, as Dante will ask later in the canto, the one that gave to Eve the bitter fruit? Are these angels, those same angels, sent to guard the entrance of the garden to bar re-entry? It would be easy to assume this is the Garden of Eden and the serpent who tempted Eve into original sin. But we need as readers not to overlook elements that the poem has already presented to us and will present to us. First, the serpent in Christian tradition has long been associated with Satan, but we have previously seen Satan frozen in ice at the end of L'Inferno. It would challenge the poem's construction and the theological message of that construction for Satan to remove himself so easily from that fate. Second, the description of this valley does not present us with an image of the earthly paradise of the Garden of Eden. Yes, it is beautiful, but it is not the garden that teems with life. That garden, in fact, will appear at the end of Purgatorio. So if this is not the Garden of Eden, and this is not the serpent who caused humanity's downfall, what is it that we are seeing? The scene is a production of sorts, drawing our attention to some key elements. Professor Ricardo Quinones notes that if the action that follows is allegorical, it is dramatically so, more in the nature of a sacra rappresentazione. That is, this is a kind of mystery play put on for Dante and his fellow pilgrims. It is not then a faithful recounting of the original sin, but an allegorical version presented to illuminate an important mystery of faith. To ensure, moreover, that we do not miss that this is not a strict retelling of the Genesis account, the sky features three torches, where previously the sky featured four bright stars. If those four stars, which appear in the opening canto of Purgatorio, were the cardinal virtues, then these three might be seen as the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Though some critics believe that these are more literal stars of southern constellations. Nevertheless, this formerly menacing snake, which caused Dante to shudder in fear, is quickly routed by the angels with blunted swords, with the poem dismissing the presence matter of factly. Hearing the green wings cleave the air, the serpent fled. So, what does it all mean? What was the allegorical drama meant to represent? The answer, of course, is pride. The pride that caused Satan to rebel, and pride that caused the original denizens of Eden to eat of the fruit of forbidden knowledge. While we might intuitively grasp the notion of pride from our cultural knowledge, the answer might also be seen in the description of the snake. The snake's description emphasizes a self-satisfied air turning its head from time to time to lick its back like a beast that sleeks itself. But what is interesting is how the drama of the snake is interrupted by Dante's reunion with his friend Nino Visconti. We should note that Nino is not yet inside purgatory, but in this valley of negligent rulers. He asks Dante to remind his daughter, a kind of Marian figure, to pray for him while he castigates his wife, a kind of Eve figure, for forgetting him. The poem allows the pilgrim an opportunity to exchange information with his friend, but it also allows for the genuine relief at finding one's friend is not damned. The poet, in fact, reflects back on this meeting, glossing the experience with the words, what joy it was to me when I saw you were not among the damned. The issue, however, is that Dante the Pilgrim can get lost in these interactions. In fact, Sordello interrupts Nino's lament on the inconstancy of his wife to focus Dante back on the tableau, causing us to recognize however righteous Nino's anger is, it is not the element that is vital to the journey of Dante. The Purgatorial Mountain focuses us on the need to acknowledge failings, and accept the cleansing pains that will perform an ablution on the penitent soul. We journey then in the next canto to the gate of purgatory where souls must humble themselves. We can come, however, only to the state of humility by listening to the world around us, by focusing on the elements that are essential to our soul's journey, something that can be more easily accomplished with guides and intercessors, an essential element that this poem will remind readers of as we climb the seven ascending terraces of Mount Purgatory. As the fictional professor of medieval literature, Dr. Henry Jones Sr. tells his son, Indiana, only the penitent man shall pass, because the penitent humbles themselves. As readers, we might think of the ways that we might need humility to join the journey, not asking why the poem does not do this or why the poem does not talk about this, but allowing the poem's guides and the poem's wisdom to enable us to ascend.